In this episode of Scaling Postgres, we talk about Postgres 12, window frames, index types, and synchronous replication. I'm Kristen Jamieson, and this is Scaling Postgres, episode 83. All right, I hope you're having a great week. Our first piece of content is actually an announcement that PostgreSQL 12 Release Candidate 1 is released. And it looks like the release of PostgreSQL 12 is set to release the full release on October 3rd, 2019. So that would be this Thursday. So this week, it looks like Postgres 12 is being released. Related to this release, there's also a timely webinar that was done called Webinar, New Features in Postgres 12 Follow-Up. This is from secondquadrantpostgresql.com, and they go through the different topics as they show here, an intro to PostgreSQL 12, SQL, JSON, improvements to partitioning, re-index concurrently, progress monitoring, generated columns, case-sensitive collations, and plans for Postgres 13. So definitely a webinar to watch. I haven't had an opportunity to watch it yet, but I will be registering to go ahead and look at the replay. But to get ready for Postgres 12, definitely a timely piece of content. The next post, also from Second Quadrant, is a PostgreSQL 12, a few special case performance enhancements. And these are very short and abbreviated. They're basically talking about a minimal decompression of toast values. Toast is where values get stored when they're too large to be put in a single record. It's kind of a spillover area. And it says it decompresses prior to 12, it decompresses the entire value. Whereas in 12, they say, uh, quote, we only decompress what we need, which can speed up accessing the toasted value. So that could be of benefit for very large records that you may be storing. Another improvement is faster float conversion to text. And then the third one is a parallel query with serializable. So it's now possible to do parallel queries with serializable isolation levels. So just a few additional performance enhancements done for PostgreSQL 12. The next piece of content is Advanced SQL Window Frames. So this is a very great article. I definitely suggest you uh, checking out. So he said there was a previous article on window functions, and this talks about window frames, so areas within uh, a window. So it's a quick overview of what window functions are basically allowing you to do things like rolling averages and things of that nature. And he has these great graphs here that represent what he's talking about. So for example, uh, he's looking at a windows by release year. So you can see this is a particular window and it's going to average the values across that window to give you what the year average is. Same thing for the next window, which is 2016, and the next window, which is 2017. So to expand upon his window example, he wanted to have a window frame example, and he wanted to use, quote, for each film, find an average rating of all strictly better films in its release year. So you're basically doing a comparison among each row. So he gives an, again, example here of where you had this um, partition or this window, and then you're looking at the window frames. He goes over the different syntax, and then talks about the three different modes. So there's the rows mode that operates at the row level, essentially, and all the different ways that you can define that frame. He looks at groups mode, and again, how to define the frame start and the frame end, and then following up with the range mode. And then he breaks that into some real world examples. Now, I, of course, don't have time to cover all of this in depth, but I this is a very great post. and I definitely suggest you take the time to check it out if you want to get better with window functions and or window frames. The next post is what Django Khan has to do with Postgres and crocodiles, an interview with Louise Grandjean from Microsoft. This is from the citusdata.com blog. And actually, this interview is mostly talking about a presentation that's going to be given called Postgres Index Types and Where to Find Them. So that's mostly what the content is about. But this starts off great, these first three uh, things that she's going to be covering in the presentation talking about one, wants the audience to understand that Postgres indexes are useful for two reasons, performance and constraints. 
So you can use a unique constraint to ensure uniqueness and also get you better performance when doing lookups. And then she talks about the second thing is an overview of different options with indexing. So you could use partial indexes, unique indexes, multi-column indexes, as well as, well as just standard indexes. And then also know when to use the different types. So there's the standard B tree, but also gen that's generally used for JSONB or text, gist, and then Bren indexes, which again can give huge space savings, uh, particularly for data types that are more sequential in nature. Now, going through this, she talks about being a Django developer and then also what advice she gives to fellow developers in terms of uh, learning Postgres. So it gives a lot of valuable information for developers that are using PostgreSQL. So if you're a developer, uh, I definitely suggest you check out this piece of content to see how you could potentially improve working with PostgreSQL. The next post is Synchronous Replication is a Trap. And this is from the Robert Haas uh, blog at blogspot.com. And what does he mean a trap? It means don't just rely on synchronous replication to assure uh, that your data is safe and on two systems. You need to take into account the holistic system that you're developing to ensure that data doesn't get lost. And he uses an example of where you have a user inputting data into a web application that then talks to a database system and that there's different failure points along that and just implementing high availability or implementing synchronous replication uh, will automatically make sure everything's safe. And you have to do more and think more holistically about the system to actually accomplish not losing data. And he just wants to make sure that people are using uh, the features appropriately. So like one thing he says here is, I have a few reservations about the use of synchronous replication for data consistency. Basically making the master re remote apply for its synchronous commit setting and then set the uh, synchronous standby names to a value that will cause it to wait for all standbys to respond to every commit. So that assures that things are written to disk across all the synchronous replicas at the same time so that you truly shouldn't lose any data. But there's, of course, downsides to that, that that he discusses here is that if one of the replicas happens to go down, now your whole system is down because it cannot synchronously replicate to that replica. So you have, a pro have to have a process in place to handle uh, those particular conditions so that your processing can still continue. He also mentions that, uh, quote, I also don't think it's a big problem to use synchronous replication to control replication lag, basically have a smaller delay when replicating to a replica by using synchronous replication. But the issue that he mostly covers here is, says, uh, quote, where I think a lot of people go wrong is when they think of about using synchronous replication for data durability. So basically a reliable system that doesn't lose data. And that's when he goes into the discussion about looking at it as a holistic system. And this is just one feature that may or may not help you accomplish that overall goal. But overall, this is a great blog post as is almost every blog post he does. So I definitely suggest uh, checking it out. The next post is how to run short alter table without long locking concurrent queries. So this is a case he's recently seen where an application had to add a column to a table. The application ran alter table add the column without a default and everything stopped for many minutes. So basically there was some long running query. And then when this alter table started running, it had an access exclusive lock. But what happens is there is a lock queue and things started backing up behind this uh, lock waiting for it. So of course, what you need to do now in this is use a timeout. Now he talks about using a statement timeout, but as mentioned in the comments that he agrees with, what would be more appropriate is the lock timeout settings. So generally when you're wanting to do these types of DDL changes, definitely use a lock timeout of some number of milliseconds or seconds. And then if it does not complete, it just errors out and doesn't do the uh, DDL statement. So definitely something to keep in mind when doing database changes to your database. The next series of posts are all related to security. 
Uh, the first one is very brief, but it talks about implementing transparent data encryption in Postgres. And this says that this is something that they've been discussing, and now it looks like it's actually moving forward, and they're going to be implementing a transparent data encryption method where the first thing they're going to accomplish is all cluster encryption. So that's the, what they're going to start with. And the hope is, quote, uh, this can be completed in Postgres 13. So we're already looking to uh, version 13 and what can potentially be in it. And it looks like this is something that they're going to try for. And this is from a momgm.us blog. The next post related to security is using row-level security to make large companies more secure. And this is from cybertech-postgresql.com. And they're talking about setting up uh, two tables, one a company table and a manager table, and defining a relationship like this, and then going through and defining a policy based upon a query of these tables to determine who has access to what data in the system. So they grant various roles and then show how it can be able to query uh, different outputs. Now, one thing they mention here is that relying on a query like this, basically this needs to be run to check that policy every time. So you could get into a performance issue, but it's just something to keep in mind if you're looking into an investigating row level security. The next post is new version of PostgreSQL anonymizer and more. And this is talking about the anonymizer. So it is a tool that uh, they've developed, and this is from uh, tadim.net, so that enables you to anonymize data. So if you have production data, it en enables you to take that uh, data, that database, scrub it, and create an anonymized version of it. So blanking out names or replacing them with uh, something else or email addresses, contact information, things of that nature. Uh, and they're talking about, you know, with the GDPR, rules in place, this could be uh, important. And he's envisioning it for use cases like if you have a standing system and you want to take production data and put it in there, you can do that if you anonymize it. So you're not worried about production data being on a separate system. So if you're interested in a tool like this, definitely a post to check out. And the last piece of content is there was a PGConf Brazil in 2019, and they've just uploaded a playlist of it looks like 22 videos to the InfoQ Brazil YouTube channel. Now, as far as I can tell, all of these presentations are in uh, Portuguese, so uh, I was unable to understand them, but I knew, do know that we have an international audience, so if this is of interest to you, definitely uh, the videos to check out. That does it for this episode of Scaling Postgres. You can get links to all the content mentioned in the show notes. Be sure to head over to scalingpostgres.com where you can sign up to receive weekly notifications of each episode. Or you can subscribe via YouTube or iTunes. Thanks.